our next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce my former postdoc advisor, Jeff McGee. Jeff is uh, a professor at the Baylor College of Medicine and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. And uh, Jeff did his uh, PhD at Tulane uh, and then uh, moved to Baylor College of Medicine for his postdoc with Dan Johnston, who was the chair of my thesis committee. Uh, and uh, he took his first faculty position at LSU, uh, and he was there until Hurricane Katrina hit the city. Uh, and then he moved uh, briefly to the University of Texas at Austin, which is where I met him while I was uh, a graduate student, uh, before uh, starting as one of the initial faculty members at Howard Hughes Medical Institute's Janelia Research Campus. And then that's where I joined him uh, as a postdoc. Uh, 13 long years ago, I'm sorry to say. Really? I think it was wow. 13. Yeah. So Jeff uh, is a world leader uh, in the field of hippocampal computation and specifically in subcellular dynamics. And he's gonna talk to us today about some incredible recent work on memory and learning in the hippocampus. Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm gonna need a power adapter. I didn't bring mine. If we could. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need, I don't see one up here. I only got 30%, maybe I can make it, but <laughs> the pressure might overwhelm me. <laughs> Thank you. Bartlett to the rescue. That one works. Oh, yeah. All right, so. <clears throat> Thank you, Mark, for that. Thank you, Ela, for the invitation. Uh, I'm excited about ICON. Uh, attacking this problem at multiple levels is really, I think, uh, an excellent way to make some progress. And so I, I would encourage you to pursue, to pursue that uh, as much as possible. Um, we try to work at three different levels, and I find it really overwhelming. So you, I think you had six or seven there, and so good luck with that. But uh, <laughs> uh, pointer, no pointer. OK. Um, all right, so <clears throat> um, I spent a long time working on dendrites when Mark was in the lab. That's pretty much all we did. Um, more recently, uh, we're studying it. Thank you again, Bartlett. Uh, we're uh, studying uh, a different function of dendrites, maybe. <laughs> Just for the pointer. And um, OK, that's a problem, but. Uh, Just for the pointer, you think? Oh, for the pointer. Yeah, perfect, all right, two of them. Um, so yes, we're trying to uh, increase our uh, understanding of how brains learn, okay? No, again, no small task. Um, and we're sort of inching our way along, uh, hopefully systematically. Uh, and that's been thought for a long time that uh, learning produces adaptive changes in uh, certain brain regions. And of course, those uh, changes are adaptive because they improve the behavior of the animal. OK, and, and so um, <clears throat> it's also been thought uh, or known for a long time that those changes in a particular uh, brain regions uh, are produced by alterations in uh, the strength of synaptic connections between neurons in those regions, and this synaptic plasticity alters the input-output transformation there uh, in a way that improves the behavior. So now I'm, I'm going to just bring up two issues um, that uh, you could say complicate this. And the first is just pure numbers, OK? And the little mouse hippocampal subregion I'm going to talk about, there are uh, 6 billion synapses, and of course, you know, uh, really astronomical numbers uh, in our brains. <clears throat> and uh, so it brings up the point, um, how is it possible for these synaptic plasticity mechanisms uh, to find the right synapses and change them appropriately all within a short amount of time as possible? Uh, and so this is one problem. Uh, and the other one is, is probably an even bigger issue something that you know, you're all familiar with, and that's what I've labeled synapse depth, and we'll just use this little 
<clears throat> multi-layer, three-layer network uh, as an analogy here. It's not a very good one, but uh, it'll serve uh, the purpose. Uh, here's the input layer at the bottom. I think of uh, sensory input coming in here. And then these synapses, these uh, cells uh, make uh, synapses onto the middle or hidden layer. And then the middle hidden layer makes synapses on the output layer, the output of which drives uh, some action. So, of course, uh, multi-layer networks are quite powerful because they can produce complex input-output transformations. Uh, the trick is, of course, how to change these six billion synapses in light of the fact that there are 60 billion other synapses and parameters downstream of them, between them and uh, the output region whose uh, output you're trying to optimize by changing the weights of all of these synapses. Of course, Hebbian plasticities aren't up to this task because they're blind to all of these downstream parameters. Okay, what's needed is some kind of uh, additional signal <coughs> that uh, brings back information uh, about uh, these parameters uh, and, um, and, and helps assist uh, this uh, synaptic plasticity process right here. This is, of course, backprop and uh, artificial neural networks. Uh, and suffice it to say that it is uh, completely unknown how uh, this works or what this signal is in real brains. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what I'm gonna talk about is uh, a little adaptive change in hippocampal uh, population activity that occurs during uh, a very simple behavior, a simple learning behavior in mice. Uh, and then I'll point out uh, the synap synaptic plasticity that's responsible for this adaptive change. And, uh, and then we'll go into some detail about the properties of uh, the instructive signal uh, that is directing the plasticity, okay? so. Here's the behavior. We work in mice, uh, they're head fixed mice. Here's one, an old one, back in the day when Mark was with us uh, from Seb Royer. And you can see that this mouse is on a treadmill. The treadmill's got some features on it and they're trained uh, to run a lap about two meters, 180 centimeters and stop and lick their water reward. Okay, very, very, very simple. But that's the learning, that's what they learn where to run to and stop and lick. And I'll show you some uh, behavioral data in a minute. Uh, during this, we're gonna make uh, one of either two kinds of recordings. The first, I'll show you some population recordings uh, from a set of about three, 400 neurons, uh, pyramidal cells in CA1. And you can see uh, the world famous uh, place cells uh, from uh, six of these uh, shown here. You can see that they uh, tile uh, the environment. Essentially, this is, these are calcium signals, of course, that rise and fall because the action potential firing rate of these cells rises and falls. Here's uh, uh, one of these uh, place uh, fields is now in uh, location. And you can see um, the heat maps of uh, the place field, the firing rate, if you will, uh, for all of these uh, six uh, neurons here, and uh, they've been sorted so that they tile the environment. You're gonna see a lot of these in the next 30 minutes. So that's what they look like. The activity's been peak scale. Okay, so here's the behavior. It's very simple. Uh, Christina's gonna have uh, you know, several days of sort of pre-training where the animal's on a belt that is blank. It has none of these somatosensory cues on it. And the reward position on the belt changes uh, from lap to lap. And uh, you can see here's the licking. Each one of these little ticks is a lick. And the animal's just licking all over the place trying to find the reward. And they're running at rather a uniform, a constant yet slow uh, velocity across the track. And here are uh, a population of 400 or so uh, CA1 uh, place cells that are recorded uh, simultaneously with this behavior. And you can see, again, they've been sorted by the position of uh, their place field, and there's a uniform tiling of uh, the entire environment. Now, next day is uh, learning day. Uh, she changes the environment by putting a bunch of uh, cues that you saw before on the belt and fixes the reward right in the middle here. And you can see the evolution of the licking is quite rapidly. Certainly by you know, 30, 40, 50 trials, the animal has figured out where the reward is and only licks right there. That's the behavior, okay? And it occurs you know, within uh, 10 minutes. 
And, uh, and what also changes uh, is that the animal begins to slow down and stop, and uh, like you saw on uh, the video uh, around the reward to consume the reward, and then begins running again. Now, <clears throat> we look at the same set of animals, same fields, microscope fields, same neurons, and we can see that there's about two, three times as many place cells now, and that there's this huge overrepresentation at the reward site. Again, nearly threefold increase in the density of place cells that have their place fields around the reward. Okay, so <clears throat> there's an experience dependent shaping of the representation. Uh, a lot of other people study this and have seen this before. Uh, this group has seen that if uh, they do an optogenetic manipulation that uh, removes uh, this overrepresentation. Then the, uh, this learning, this evolution of licking, also doesn't happen. So we would call this an adaptive change. Okay, so this is our adaptive change in hippocampal activity. Now, <clears throat> what's going on? I, I told you there was about two or three times as many place fields uh, in, on at the end of day one as uh, from the beginning. And what's basically happening is there are new place fields appearing uh, during the session, okay? And there are four characteristics, four or five characteristics uh, of these new place uh, fields that uh, are relevant uh, to what I'm gonna tell you. And uh, so the first is that they, you can see here, they, they just sort of pop up, okay? They're abruptly, they appear abruptly. So no real hints that there's any kind of activity already here. They're not sort of ramping up over time. They just, boom, appear, okay? And many people in the hippocampal world uh, see place cells that do this. Now, the other thing is you'll see that they tend to uh, shift back in space. In this case, we're in space. So the first field is here, and then on the subsequent two or three, it moves back and stays there. And the same is here. Uh, it moves back and stays there, okay? And so there's this predictive shift step back in space. Next, you can already see as well, is that depending on the running speed of the animal and when the place field appears, the width of the place field changes as well, okay? The faster they run, the wider the field that's gonna result, okay? And finally, uh, all of this uh, and the development of the overrepresentation and the increase in the number of place cells, all the adaptive changes uh, can be blocked by changes in uh, uh, different drugs which block uh, plasticity in these uh, regions like NMDA receptor antagonist and, <clears throat> and a blocker of R-type calcium channels or even L-type calcium channels uh, will remove these adaptive changes. Okay, so let's see. So um, I don't really have time to go into this too much. I'm gonna show you quickly what I'm talking about in a minute. But synaptic plasticity, we found over the past 10 years or so, that these place fields are, are driven by a synaptic plasticity, okay? There's a ramp of depolarization of the membrane potential that crosses threshold and uh, produces then uh, action potential firing at a particular location. That ramp of depolarization is produced by an enhanced weights of the synaptic input, the excitatory synaptic inputs that's coming in. Okay, so I'm gonna show you one example and then a little bit of population data and then cut to the cartoon. Okay, it's unfortunate, but uh, if you'd like to talk to me in more detail about it, uh, I'd be happy to. Um, all right, so this is the other way that we record from uh, these animals, and that is whole cell uh, voltage recordings uh, while the animal's doing the same thing that I've already showed you. Um, what's going to happen is uh, the animal's gonna be running these laps, and here's the VM, and, and, uh, and then the position of the animal from zero to 180 centimeters is in red, and then there's an extracellular voltage that's been uh, filtered at theta band uh, frequencies. A, a, Dendritic calcium spike, dendritic calcium plateau potential is going to occur on one trial and then on the next trial there'll be a place field there. Okay, and these, these plateau potentials occur out in the distal uh, apical dendrite. So here we go, I gotta hold it down to make it go twice as fast. You can see there's one lap, there's essentially no uh, place field there and this is the animal standing, nothing's going on. There's a little bit of firing uh, while the animal's standing and when it starts running, 
uh, there's you know, a flat line on the VM. We'll do one more uh, pre-lap, some firing while the animal's standing. And then, okay, again, nothing. And then on the next trial, you'll see plateau potential go off. You'll notice nothing out here, no spikes. And then on uh, the next trial, you'll see increased depolarization at a place field uh, on the next lap. Uh, these are current injections to check uh, input resist uh, series resistance. And, um, and the place field is there. I think I got one more. I'll do one more lap. There it is, a nice uh, place field that's developed. And then the animal actually forgets to stop, and the place field is even smaller. <coughs> um, OK. So here's all of the data, all the laps. You can see the first 10 trials, nothing. Then plateau potential goes off. There's no action potentials or anything before. You know, of course, uh, there's something going on with this giant calcium spike. And then afterwards, uh, there's a place field that stays uh, for the additional 20 minutes of the animals on the track. And that's what the plateau looks like at the SOMA. It's basically you know, a 50 or 60 millivolt uh, 500 millisecond long uh, uh, calcium channel mediated action potential out in the dendrites that propagates semi uh, uh, actively throughout the entire neuron, broadcasting this global signal. And um, here are these average of uh, these trials in gray, uh, and now we've uh, bend them in space. There's a little bit of time bends as well, so you can see before. And here's what, uh, after uh, the, the plateau, um, you can see that there's a very large ramp of depolarization. So these are the VMs that have been median filtered. That takes the spikes off. And so you can just see this underlying ramp of depolarization, quite large. In this case, we can subtract these two things and use a time base based on the running uh, during this one trial when the plateau potential went off. It's referenced to that, so it takes four seconds to run uh, from the very beginning of the track to the plateau, and then another two or three seconds from the plateau to the end, okay? And then what you can see then is, so this is just a subtraction of these two traces, that this change in the membrane potential is covering about six seconds, okay? So it's a multi-second long uh, plasticity, and that it is also asymmetric in that it's projecting further back than forwards. Okay, and you can see that the peak is actually shifted as well. So it produces the first, the second thing that I showed you. First of all, uh, it's abrupt, okay? It's abrupt because these plateau potentials are so strong. Bam, one time, and you get a place field, you get all the plasticity. It causes the place field to shift back because of this asymmetric plasticity kernel, okay? And, uh, and then it's operating on the seconds time scale so, uh, you know, depending on how fast the animal is running, the width will also vary accordingly. All of this can be blocked by, again, NMDA receptor antagonists, both in vivo and in vitro, as well as calcium channel blockers. Um, here's from the population. Again, it's asymmetric, covering multiple seconds. Uh, these are all um, cells that didn't have really much of a ramp, we call them silent cells because they're silent. Um, but not only that, they don't have much of even a sub-threshold uh, change in the membrane potential. Um, so about two-thirds of these we've actually injected current into uh, to drive the plateau potentials. Okay, so if we have a cell like this and we inject current uh, somewhere else, then it, when a cell that has already has a place field then this, the initial place field will get smaller. Let's say we injected current here. The initial place field will get smaller, and, uh, and uh, this part would uh, increase in depolarization. So the plasticity is not just a potentiation. It's also a depression. It's bidirectional, and they're happening both at the same time. And you can see that here. If there's already a place cell, and we either add uh, uh, plateau potentials or one happens spontaneously, then you can also see, in addition to less potentiation, you get uh, this obvious uh, depression component as well, this negative change uh, in the membrane potential. Okay, so as I'll show you in a second, that means that uh, the, 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 the sort of equilibrium amount of plasticity that you're going to get is dependent upon the weights that are already there, the current weights uh, in 
uh, in the in the vector of this one cell. Okay, so this is this is a place cell because there's a depolarization. This depolarization is there is because the weights of these inputs are higher. So now they can uh, be depotentiated, if you will. All right, so here's the cartoon then. And uh, we, we'll start off with just sort of the basic Hebbian idea. Here's a postsynaptic cell, here's a presynaptic cell. Uh, correlated input output, you get plasticity. Uh, we call this plasticity that I've just showed you uh, BTSP, behavioral time scale synaptic plasticity, and it requires additional components. One is a new compartment, okay? We need an apical dendrite, and we also need a new voltage signal. Instead of just having an output uh, signal that's driving the plasticity, changes in the weights, we're gonna have a plateau potential which is more or less solely responsible for producing plasticity. It's not really an output signal. It's just a plasticity signal, just a plasticity signal. <clears throat> and then we're gonna need an additional input whose job is mainly to drive uh, the plasticity through plateau potential initiation. Okay, and then we're also gonna need some biochemical signals to stretch this thing out in time, some filters of both uh, the synaptic input and uh, the plateau potential. I'll just tell you that we've been trying to figure these out. Uh, it's not easy, and we really haven't made any progress. <laughs> that, that's the bottom line on that. Um, uh, it, it's, it's biochemistry, and that's, that's a little out of our wheelhouse, and this is what we're talking about. If you get too down in a, the wrong layer, then mm, you know, things start to go sour on you. But hopefully somebody else can, uh, uh, can, and can figure these things out, because this is still theoretical, okay? There's very little evidence of these biochemical signals. Now, uh, Attila Lashanzi's lab has published something recently uh, with, uh, with Fred, Frank, Polo, um, that, that, that showed that there may be an involvement of uh, calcium release, calcium-induced calcium release uh, that may be involved with this um, <coughs> instructive signal. Anyway, um, the, cartoon, uh, the cartoon equation is here. Uh, the change into weights uh, is basically, here's the heart of the matter, the overlap of these two biochemical signals, okay? And so this determines which synapses, this is the pick which synapses are gonna change, exactly which direction and how much is dependent on the overlap as well. And then uh, how far away, this is the potentiation component here. In this case, if, if the potentiation, these are the weights that are already there, this is the current weight. Uh, if it's high, of course, then this potentiation is gonna be small. If it's low, it can be quite large. And then there's just the sort of balance of this uh, by the uh, depression component, which again is uh, scaled by uh, the current weights. Here's, here's the paper, Aaron's paper in eLife, uh, where the real equation lives, and you can uh, go and see that. Yeah, is that enough? Um, that's the plasticity. Um, and uh, now, you know, some details, I hope you like details, on uh, this instructive pathway, and uh, where is it coming from, what, what's it doing, and, and what kind of signal is it? <clears throat> and um, so, you know, we, we knew from, from the past work that, and, and just sort of bloody obvious anatomy, uh, where to look. Uh, interonal cortex, layer three neurons are pyramidal cells, and, and they, they project a pathway that, you know, almost exclusively innervates uh, the distal apical tuft of these cells uh, where this plateau potential is initiated. So uh, Christina is going to do an optogenetic experiment. Now she doesn't wanna blast the whole network. Uh, she's trying to make a subtle change so that the behavior doesn't change and that, you know, uh, this is a loop. Somehow it's not very direct, but the EC and the hippocampus are tied together, so she doesn't want to inadvertently change uh, the afferent input, the feed forward input as well. So she's going to use uh, a, a retrograde virus to just infect uh, the EC uh, cells uh, that are sending their axons into this particular region of the hippocampus. She's also going to infect uh, and express GCAMP in that uh, same region and record uh, from this population of, of pyramidal cells, put a light fiber in uh, the EC to uh, activate the archaeorhodopsin or under at least the control conditions, just cells that uh, are expressing tomato. There's a light fiber, you turn the light on around uh, the reward location. 
run the animal and do everything normal, and uh, there's basically no effect. Okay, you can see the overrepresentation in the middle. And then uh, in the test group, then, with the archaeoridopsin, she has uh, more or less inhibited the activity of a small subset of EC cells and changed, removed uh, the adaptive change, the plasticity in the CA1 hippocampal region, okay? Manipulate an external region and change uh, the plasticity in, in this one region. Really nice. Um, and uh, you can see that's quantified there. Okay, so uh, something's going on in the EC. It's somehow uh, sending uh, uh, some input that's helping to uh, drive or direct this um, plasticity in, in CA1. Next step is to record from these axons and see what kind of activity they have. <clears throat> Bottom line is uh, that, you know, there's about five and maybe less than 10% that show some decent uh, spatial selectivity, but most of them uh, are these kind of uh, crappy, uh, sloppy, uh, place-specific uh, uh, cells that have some uh, specific firing at a particular location in the world. <clears throat> you can see, uh, you know, here's one cell, many trials, position that I didn't label. Here it is, position. And you can see that, you know, there's a stochasticity to this firing that's a little bit weird, okay? And so that led us to try to look at the distribution of these on times and off times. And it's true that, you know, you need hundreds of these openings and there's only 20 cells out of a, a thousand that we were, had this many uh, transitions in. But in those uh, cells, um, uh, there, the, there is an exponential distribution of uh, the on and off uh, times of uh, these cells. So <clears throat> bottom line is uh, there's some moderate tuning, moderate spatial tuning uh, of the EC input uh, with hints of some kind of non-standard activity. Okay, so here's another hint of non-standard activity. Uh, here's all of the, you know, 800 cells uh, for this. We're still in the same environment, okay, uh, that I showed you before. And here's the uh, average of uh, the odd lap trials, zero, two, four, six, eight, et cetera. And you can see they've been sorted according to the location of their peak. And then if we look at the same cells, sorted the same way, but uh, for the intervening uh, laps, one, three, five, nine, you can see that uh, you know, there's, there's some stochasticity there. They're not very uh, stable. But there is, you know, there is a little hint of stability here. And then if we plot these uh, locations for the even, the peak locations for the even laps versus the odd laps, it's not exactly a shotgun blast, but uh, pretty close. There is only 20% of uh, these cells that have uh, some stability to uh, their finding. We made a model of all this activity in order to try to understand uh, how it would be uh, summed up uh, postsynaptically and drive uh, plateau potentials, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about that, but uh, be happy to answer questions about it at any time. Uh, the basic idea is that we just reproduce, uh, you know, it, it's a very simple model, okay, but it, it really captures a lot of the uh, activity in an amazing way. 2,000 uh, two-state Markov chains with a little bit of tweaking on uh, the transition probabilities, the activation probability to produce the sloppy tuning. And then we just distribute them equally, uh, uniformly across space, okay? And that matches the data. This is basically a quantification of that. And the model does the same thing. Now in the model, we can simulate the uh, mouse running at a constant rate. And lo and behold, there is a constant rate of plateaus that are initiated across the track, okay? Not surprising. What is interesting about this is how low this rate is, okay? So it's 0 0.5 times 10 to the minus three uh, per second per cell. So there's 10,000 postsynaptic cells in this case, 50 laps, 10 seconds. That gives you about 2,500 plateau potentials, 2,500 new place cells out of 10,000. So even at this incredibly low rate, you can significantly change the number of place cells that are in, uh, in the population. Just for comparison, if you had 40%, 4,000 of your cells were place cells and they had 10 hertz uh, firing for one second, you get 1,000 times more action potentials than you would plateau potentials, okay? So it is a very low rate of occurrence of plateau potentials, which fits with the data. Now, if the animals 
obviously not running at a constant speed, but is slowing down around uh, the reward site. And here's the real data for uh, that average of 14 animals. Um, and if we use that instead of this constant rate, then you can see that the constant rate of plateau potentials where an animal is actually dwelling for twice as long, as long around the reward will give you twice as many plateau potentials, twice as many play cells at that location. Okay, it's that simple. And so that's our prediction of uh, what all of this activity should give you in terms of a representation in CA1. <clears throat> Here's the actual representation in CA1 in black, and now this is in gray. You can see that, yeah, it's in the right place, it's twofold, but the data is actually a threefold increase. And, <clears throat> you know, there is a significant correlation here. Now you can say, oh, well, you know, this was a very simple model, you're lucky to have gotten that, and that's pretty much what we said. Uh, but there is a difference, and, and that's what I was gonna show you here. There's actually a little more tuning. of The, the cells around the reward site are actually a little bit more tuned. And um, maybe that's what's going on there, or maybe we should just count our lucky stars and move on, which is what we did. So bottom line is, uh, there's a uniform distribution of these uh, moderately tuned cells. So that, uh, plus the running behavior of the animal, basically explains uh, the change uh, or the type of uh, distribution of uh, play cells that we see in the CA1 representation. Now, it also suggested to us that, uh, you know, you can remember the somatosensory cues were, were uniformly distributed across the track. Okay, so we thought maybe that uniform distribution of these EC of the EC activity is, you know, representing that uniform distribution of uh, the cues in the environment, and so we're going to switch and try to test that. We're going to remove all the cues, and uh, and have a blank belt and just use a, a light stimulus, 50 uh, centimeters in front of the reward. So it's predictive. And it's strong, it's novel, animals never seen this. It's a flashing light right in its eyes, 10 hertz. You can see that the licking behavior is subtly changed, but not too dramatically, but that the running behavior is quite different, okay? So here's what I just showed you in black for environment A, and now in environment B, the animal starts to slow down around the light stimulus and then just continues to gradually slow and then uh, continue on after the reward. So what do we get? Uh, from the EC, now 800 cells, again, the same idea. Uh, here's uh, the even trial, uh, the odd trials, and then the average of the even trials. <clears throat> you can again see that, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of stochasticity still left in this, but you can see the shadow here. Now there's about three or five times as many of these cells, and again, on this plot here, right at the site of, uh, of the light uh, that we didn't uh, see before. Okay, here this is uh, quantified again. Uh, there's about a fourfold increase in the uh, density of EC cells who peak, whose peak activity is around the light. There's the model in the lighter colors, which are difficult to see. Um, so uh, that's the model, and then you know we do the same thing with the actual running versus the constant. Here's the prediction of uh, the plateaus in the postsynaptic population. You can see that uh, there is a difference. Again, uh, the running is making a difference, but because there's just, it's not just as distinct as it was before in uh, uh, the environment A, there's not as big of a difference. And, and really, there's, there's a big change in uh, the density of, uh, of plateaus around the light that kind of tapers off slowly as you go. Now, what, so that's the prediction of what the CA1 should look like, the distribution of uh, place cells in the, in the CA1 in this new environment. Here it is. You can see the overrepresentation there. Here it is uh, quantified. There's about a two, three-fold increase in uh, the CA1 place cells around the light. Less of an effect, maybe 75% increase versus, you know, two to three-fold increase in B. Uh, here are the, uh, the, the prediction in light colored red uh, from the model and then the actual uh, from the CA1 data in uh, in the darker color, again, there's a significant correlation between those two. So it looks like then that the EC is adjusting itself and its activity uh, to uh, the density or the distribution of relevant cues in the environment and using that as a training signal or teaching signal uh, uh, to 
tell the hip to shape uh, the type of representation that's present in CA1. All right, last slide. Um, what kind of uh, uh, instructive signal is this? Is it an error signal like we would expect, like in the Purkinje cells and, and the cerebellum? So here's something that I didn't show you before. Uh, here's uh, the number or the fraction of uh, play cells, new play cells that are appearing during the trial. Okay, so you can see in these sections of 25 laps that about three quarters of the cells that are going to appear, appear within the first 25 trials. And then this drops like a rock, such that by 50 trials, there's essentially no plas very little plasticity left. Okay, so, whoops, if, <clears throat> if this were an error signal, we would expect it to track uh, this uh, same sort of plasticity profile here. Instead, uh, our measure of EC activity in both environments uh, stays relatively constant, okay? So this suggests to us that this is not uh, an error signal coming in from uh, the entrinal cortex and that it's probably more like a desired or target uh, signal that's coming in, okay? And so we can make the control system analogy, the weak analogy again, uh, where we have, uh, you know, here's the components uh, of this here. Again, uh, the basis set comes up uh, and from, so there's a feed forward input from uh, CA3 of already uh, tuned place cells. And then there's a target coming in from the entorinal cortex. There's a population activity in CA1 that's fed back through uh, somatostatin positive OLM interneurons who again, exclusively uh, innervate uh, the tuft of these pyramidal cells in CA1. This is uh, a, a obviously an in inhibitory input. And so the uh, a apical dendrite tuft of these cells, this distal region of the tree, is acting like a comparator for these two activities in two different brain regions, okay? The activity in the entorhinal cortex is compared with the activity in uh, the CA1 via this feedback inhibition. And uh, if the target exceeds the uh, inhibition, the actual, then there's an error local in each individual pyramidal cell, and that error is the plateau potential. Okay, the plateau potential then produces plasticity that changes the actual CA1 activity. Okay, and so if we look at this in time, we remove the real data and put the cartoon up, that's always nice. We can see uh, the activity from the target, from the EC, is up here, where the activity in, in CA1 is down here. There's a difference in the activity. This produces a large amount of plasticity in CA1 and plateau potentials. That increases the, uh, <clears throat> the activity in, or just brings it closer in space to, uh, to the target. That reduces the plasticity and turns everything off. Okay, so as these two activities approach each other, this reduces the error signal in the individual local uh, regions of CA1 pyramidal cells and cuts the plasticity off. All right, so that's it. There it is in space, same idea. Um, I'll spare you this. Basically, it, it's that it, it appears that the entorhinal cortex in these case is collecting you know, external input and internal input from self-motion and maybe decision-making areas or something, and, and producing a kind of quick and dirty uh, uh, estimation of what's important in the world. And that, that's using, and then sending out targets based upon this sort of quick and dirty understanding about the aspects of the world to train the hippocampus, which in the end, you know, shapes itself depending on what the hippocampus, what the EC thinks is important. And because all of this plasticity produces shifts in the place fields, these are now predictions. And so one of the ideas is actually these predictions may then be targets themselves that get sent broadcast throughout the entire brain uh, to, to help uh, it learn as well. Um, all right, so let me mention Christina. She did almost everything that I showed you today. And uh, she's your neighbor now up at Brandeis. Uh, she's very talented. Uh, look her up sometime. And then, uh, you know, Slashen did uh, some of uh, the G-Camp imaging, Yuding, and another student in the lab, of course, with Katie, uh, did all of the uh, wholesale recordings. And Randy keeps things running. We still have a lot of good interactions with our old colleagues at Genelia. Thanks.
Thank you, uh, Jeff, that was great. Um, I'm wondering about, given that the synaptic weight affects the ex expression of BTSP, when you expose the animal to a second new environment, is there a relationship uh, in the same cells of their new preferred place field? Is there a relationship with what? Uh, in the, in the, if you have you know, new place fields forming in that second environment, yeah. do you see a correlation in the previous place field location and the uh, future one? A prior, a memory, yes. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at that, that's all I can say. That's what Sasha's working, Sasha's working on. Very savvy, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say anything, he'd kill me. Yes. Um, I, yeah, um, thank you, Jeff. That was really, really interesting. Um, this, this rapid drop-off in uh, place field formation that happens, like, you know, you get a lot and then suddenly there's very little. Yeah. Is that because the, uh, the entorhinal cortex is sending out fewer blasts, uh, or is that because the blasts are not being registered or not doing anything? Um, well, so probably just the way that I expressed this made it look a little more jumpy than it is. This is in blocks, okay? So it's 25, then 25 trials. Um, but the point is that uh, the EC activity really isn't changing. I just showed you a very simple sort of uh, overall sum of the average, but the population vector isn't changing much at either as the animal you know, goes through the entire session. So it has to be something else that's, uh, that's turning the plasticity off. And that, that's, what we, that's, that's where the, the control system thing comes in, where the, the feedback from the OLM interneurons, which innervate the, the plateau, these are somatostatin positive cells, like Martinati cells, actually shuts down every, all the plasticity, the plateaus. Nothing changes in the EC. It still thinks, okay, this is what you should be doing. But if you, if you took the mouse and you put it in a different environment, like after, after 25 trials, then it would still be able to learn the new environment. It would still be, I mean, it, would, it, would, it could yeah. learn constantly, it just doesn't like to learn more in the same environment. Is that how That's it? correct. And the, and the idea would be just that the activity of CA1 is approaching the target. Okay, and, that, and so if you put it in a new environment, then the target would change, and that would drive new plasticity. And so this is oversimplified, okay? There's obviously other things, attentional modulation and, and other things like that that are gonna be involved, okay? And, we don't, and this is the most theoretical part of it. We don't really know what's shutting it off, but this is our theory. And, and Aaron's mo made a model of this in this paper as well, and it works. Um, and so uh, that's the idea, Bartlett, that, that there's some component within the network that's shutting the plasticity off as the activities come together. Thank you. Um, so, so you discovered a new type of plasticity, right? The BTSP yeah. uh, in vivo. Um, and people have been trying to look at plasticity in vitro and slices for many, many years. So, so what is the implication of this? Do you expect that we will find many more different, many more different plasticity rules that we couldn't find before in vitro, or can you? Tell us a little bit why you're uh, able to do this. I think there are enough plasticity in vitro rules. Um, hopefully we won't find too many more. Um, this, this one is in, in vivo. This one shows up in vivo. We haven't done the, the LTD, the, the depotentiation portion of it, um, but we need to. Um, you know, hopefully other people will start looking at uh, other brain areas. The neocortex would be interesting to see if this is present in other pyramidal-based circuits like uh, Bartlett showed you this is a canonical theme. It's the same circuit here as it is everywhere, so this could happen. Layer five cells are a little bit different. They're like twice as long, and there's more complicated stuff going on, so it would be really interesting to see if it's going on there. Now, I will tell you, we've, we, we've looked at least uh, in vivo in the previous hippocampal stage, and this is also there. There's a plateau-based seconds long plasticity that's responsible for place fields in CA3. Um, We've toyed around with other pyramidal subiculum, things like this, and it seems to be there as well. Uh, so um, this is, uh, you know, I think at least in the hippocampus, it's established now, and multiple labs have seen it. 
The question, I think, is how widespread it is. Is it gonna be just hippocampus? Is it gonna be neocortex too? Just pyramidal cells? How about the granule cells? How about stellate cells, things like that? So, uh, you know, I would encourage everybody to do this. It's not the easiest thing in the world to get a calcium spike in a slice. It takes modulation, and then you gotta deal with all this other changes, constantly changing conditions if you dump muscarine on or something like that. Um, and so, you know, we may have to refine the conditions, but uh, I would still, you know, whoever's interested in this, this is a very different form of plasticity in learning uh, than standard heavy end kinds of things that people, that all of us really, myself included, studied for 50 years. So um, it's worth looking into. Thank you. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and even for an engineer, signal usually you start gradually, maybe you like this path, you continue, or you go through yeah. the dynamic process. So the fact that it's so discreet, um, any kind of ideas or recommendations? Well, so it's only discrete in the individual components. Okay. I mean, so it still occurs over 50 trials, you know, tens of minutes. Uh, and and it, it is only discrete in the individual cells which in the past with the heavy end kinds of plasticities, STDP and all of these things, it would take dozens of these trials in the individual cells. So not only would the overall population be slowly evolving, but the individual neurons within the population would be slowly expressing this plasticity as well, which may be very important you know, behavior uh, developmentally, okay, for to, develop, to develop these different receptive fields probably is doing something heavy and over many weeks or something like that. But in this case, it is, it is abrupt and sudden within the individual neurons. And that allows the whole population to evolve more rapidly, but not, not over the individual. We're only talking a few you know, tens of cells within the whole population per trial, something like that. I was going to follow up and ask if there are any behavioral correlates, but then it's really not confined at the level. Well, so this is the level of the population. It's not as sharp. It just looks like it here. This is 50 trials in. Okay, it's two points, but we've done it this way. Um, and what does correlate with this is that licking behavior. Okay, so if you plotted these two versus the evolution of the licking, the number of the fraction of licks outside of the reward site, they, they map, you know, almost perfectly. Now, you know, we don't like to, you know, I don't really like to talk about that in the paper or anything like that because then it's obvious, well, you should do that experiment. And, you know, we don't really want to try to block. Uh, other people have already done that experiment. It's hard to block. The hippocampus is this huge, sprawling thing. And to, to actually, you know, manipulate the whole thing is not that easy. And so we haven't done that, but other people have. Okay, Great thanks a lot. Thanks.